Chapter Thirteen of Julia Reed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Julia Reed by Pansy. Chapter Thirteen, in which I follow a false light. It was a wretched night to me. After living over all the horrors of that walk with my waking senses, feeling anew the terror and disgrace and shame and pain, I finally slept and went over in detail every little incident of the evening adding to its horrors by every phantasm that my excited unreasoning brain could conjure i was thankful for morning and yet felt ashamed to meet the household however that ordeal was safely passed dr douglas had apparently no remembrance of the frightful scene through which we had so lately passed together he neither by word look nor act alluded to it except that perhaps he seemed a trifler gentler to me than usual after scanning Mrs. Tyndall's face as narrowly as I could, I concluded that she was in blissful ignorance of the entire affair, a fact which rather surprised me, for I had come to feel as if she must discover things by a sort of instinct, so prompt and complete was her knowledge of what was transpiring around her. But on this morning she chatted gaily about the party, asked numerous questions concerning the entertainment, quoted Jerome as freely as usual, and seemed entirely at ease and satisfied with everything. At the shop I heard, or rather overheard, that Mr. Sales had gone somewhere by the early train. Caroline Brighton informed us that she accompanied him to the depot, with a mischievous look divided between Frank Hooper and myself. "'Where is he going?' Frank asked in an indifferent tone, while I felt my face flush to my very temples at the mention of his name, and I listened nervously for Caroline's answer." couldn't say i'm in doubt as to whether he knew himself i asked him but he answered me very savagely that he was going to the northeast corner of nowhere if such a place was to be found the fact is he seemed to be in a sad state of mind i asked him if anybody had refused him to make him so good-natured this with a side glance at me and my cheeks flamed again at the bare thought of what torture such questions must have been to him frank seemed entirely unconcerned and I concluded that at least Mrs. Tyndall must have been mistaken about her. Meantime, other matters were coming up to claim every leisure moment. The festival that was postponed at Christmas time, because of the illness of some of the prominent workers, was now in full process of preparation, rehearsal for the tableaus and music nearly every evening, and constant plannings as to costumes, characters, etc., in the midst of which I tried to analyze my feelings toward Mr. Sales indignation mixed strongly with a touch of compassion that i had for him and there had been at first a very decided determination to have nothing more to do with him but as the days passed and he seemed willing to take it for granted that all friendship was over between us a certain sense of pique began to mix with my just indignation and i said to myself that it would have been more gentlemanly in him to have attempted an apology than to have maintained such a stupid silence I heard of his return. Our town gossip, Caroline Brighton, announced to us one morning that Jerome Sales had just got back from nowhere, and that his trip did not seem to have improved his temper. But I saw not a glimpse of him, and felt guilty and confused when Mrs. Tyndall innocently wondered why Jerome did not call. It was the fifth day after the party that the doctor came to the shop with my mail. There were long letters from Mother and Sadie, and a drop letter, stylish and graceful in form and penmanship. Frank Hooper passed my desk as I was curiously examining the envelope of my unknown correspondent, and as she glanced down at it, I noticed a little pink flush on her cheek. Then I broke the seal with a sudden surmise as to whose it was, and read, Regent Street, Friday evening. Miss Reed, five days ago, in the event of addressing a note to you, I should have added, My dear friend, but to-night I am bitterly conscious of having forfeited all right to call you friend. I have been silent during these fearful days because I could think of no fitting words in which to couch my, I cannot call it explanation or apology, because such conduct as mine, I am well aware, cannot be explained away, and even to attempt an apology may seem to you insulting. Yet I cannot pass it by longer in silence." I have thought of the matter during these five fearful days and nights in all its phases, and I can but think that if you could imagine but one-tenth of the pain that I have experienced during this time, even you could feel an emotion of pity for me. 
I have finally decided to break the silence and, not cast myself on your mercy, for I am conscious that I have no right to claim mercy at your hand, but to beg, implore, your forgiveness. I do not offer it as an explanation, but simply as a fact that I was ill on New Year's Day, and that the small amount of wine that I drank had a most unaccountable effect upon me, an effect of which I had not dreamed. It was no greater quantity than I have taken many times before with the most perfect ease. I have no memory of what passed that evening, so I do not know what you have to forgive. I only know that it is a great thing to ask, and yet I ask it. I fancy you superior to most young ladies of my acquaintance. I think when one who has insulted you, though how unintentional only God knows, comes to you frankly, humbly, and says, Forgive me, that your own Christian character will prompt you to listen to his petition. I ask even more than this, that you will not only forgive, but prove your deed by allowing me to call you friend as heretofore. I value your friendship, Julia, enough to sue for it in this lowly manner. More I could not say. I am asking great things, and yet I earnestly believe not too great things for your large-hearted nobleness of character to grant. I beg that you will answer me by letter, and I pray you, Julia, to grant me an interview. If you will name an hour when you will see me, I shall know then how to thank you. Yours sadly but hopefully, Jerome J. Sales. This letter touched me, touched my heart and my vanity. I gave little thought to the vanity then. I gave my heart the credit of all the softened feelings. But I know now that vanity had at least as much to do with it as heart. I was very anxious to be superior to most young ladies, and yet I was very much disgusted with Mr. Sales. It was curious, but during those intervening days I had not been able to hold the image of Mr. Sales, the fastidious, courteous, cultured gentleman of my acquaintance, before my eyes. I continually saw that silly-faced creature who floundered on the icy pavement on that never-to-be-forgotten night. I studied over the letter. What should I do? What ought I to do? I earnestly tried to think what would be right. I had seemed to myself to be more under Dr. Douglas's influence during this past week, and I instantly wondered what he would think about it. I remembered penitently that my mother wished me to be guided by him, and I took a sudden resolution to consult him. Chance favored me as I was hurrying homeward at noon. He joined me. I plunged nervously into my subject. Doctor, how do you think one ought to treat a person who has injured you and afterward asks your forgiveness? One ought to follow the master's own rule, whatsoever ye would. I know, of course, that is the guide, and yet, well, should matters be just the same with such persons as they were before? Ah, that is a question which requires very careful consideration and a definite knowledge of what one is talking about. I can conceive of cases where, with the most complete forgiveness, friendship should by no means be based on the old footing. For instance, one may have decided that the influence of an acquaintance is injurious. That association is unwise, and in that case, undoubtedly, it should be avoided. But I am talking in the dark, Julia. If you feel willing to explain yourself to me, I may be able to help you. My answer was low and somewhat hesitating. I was thinking of Mr. Sales, and I was conscious of receiving a very searching look before he said, Has he sued for your forgiveness? And when I bowed in reply, he added, with emphasis, He certainly has sufficient reason. I immediately roused to the defensive. He was ill on New Year's evening, and the small amount of wine that he took affected him as it never had before. The doctor's answer was quick and decisive. Don't allow him to impose on you in that absurd way. I have had experience with drunken men, and I know whereof I speak. The man was simply intoxicated. My only wonder is that he was in a state to come for you at all. I met him three times during that day, and each time saw him swallow liquor enough to intoxicate a habitually sober man. Twice I warned him that he was in a dangerous condition, but he gaily assured me that he was used to it. This shocked and disgusted me, and I had no disposition to continue my defense, even if I could have found any arguments. So I remained silent, and after walking the length of a block without speaking, the doctor continued. I hope and trust that you may be able to forgive him, but it was a grievous insult. The man must have known that he was in no condition for ladies' society. 
I told him at five o'clock that he had lost the power of walking straight, and begged him to plead indisposition and send an apology. But he was so far gone that he swore at me for my pains. I am very sorry for poor victims who are led away by the clamor of an awful appetite, but when a man deliberately boasts, as he twice did to me on New Year's Day, the amount of liquor that his brain will endure, I have very little charity for him. Aside from this, Julia, the man is not what your mother would like to have an associate of yours be. If you will forgive me for advising you, I would use the opportunity for breaking an acquaintance that can result in nothing but annoyance and discomfort to you. But, I said hesitatingly, suppose I should be the means of discouraging him and helping him downward. Has he begun to help himself upward? Does he promise that similar disgrace shall be spared his friends in future? I was startled by the question, and hastily ran over in my mind the note I had received. There was certainly no promises or resolutions for the future expressed in it. True, they might be inferred from the general tenor of the letter, and yet, if he continued to indulge his taste for liquor, how was he to be certain that no disgraceful consequence would ensue? And I felt certain that Mr. Sales continued his allowance of wine, even during these days of distress and anxiety. The doctor, finding I made no answer to his question, continued the conversation. That idea of discouraging people ought to be sparingly indulged in. In the first place, we ought to be very sure that there is any genuine attempt at reformation, and secondly, that we are strong enough, spiritually, to help tide our friends over the dangerous places. By this time we had reached the door, and Mrs. Tyndall met us in the hall. So further conversation was impossible. But my resolution was formed, or rather confirmed, to have nothing more to do with Mr. Sales. I was very much puzzled as to how to reply to his letter, and, after thinking about it most of the afternoon, to the great detriment of my account book, I finally decided to make no reply at all, at least for the present. I thought my silence would sufficiently assure him of my desire to drop the friendship, and as for my forgiveness, I concluded that when the next chance threw us together it would be time enough to say a few words on that subject. We were sitting together the following evening, Mrs. Tyndall and I. There was to be a rehearsal in the hall at seven o'clock, and we had but an hour in which to arrange a toilet for Queen Vashti. Mrs. Tyndall held an exquisite coronal up for my admiration, as she questioned, "'Have you seen Jerome today, Julia?' "'No,' I answered, with deeply flushing cheeks. "'Where can he keep himself, provoking fellow? I think we shall have to send a note to him.' He ought to be present this very evening to practice for that Turkish scene. It is going to need a great deal of practice, and your part is so involved in his that one alone can do almost nothing. I answered in dire confusion. I am not going to take part in the Turkish scene, Mrs. Tyndall. I thought you knew. I mean, I thought you had given that up. My dear child, I never give anything up, least of all a thing so perfectly beautiful as that Turkish scene is going to be. I expect it to be the crown of all our tableaus. Nevertheless, I said steadily, I cannot take my part. I am very sorry to disappoint you, but it is quite impossible. Mrs. Tyndall turned her crown thoughtfully around on her hand and said, Look here, Julia, don't you think this would be improved if we had one more diamond pin for the left side? Before she made any answer to my last remark. It was a way she had, to appear quite interested in her work, and but partially attentive to what you were saying, if you chanced to be saying anything that you thought would specially move her ire. Then she said, I am sorry you did not tell me of your determination before. Explanations are so exceedingly disagreeable, and of course all our party knew that you were to be associated with Mr. Sales in this scene. What am I to say, my dear, that you and he have had a quarrel? It was only last evening we were talking about it, the tableau, not the quarrel, and I explained to Lycia Simons how it was arranged. I felt confused and annoyed, but strangely determined not to take Mrs. Tyndall into my confidence, so I answered with what playfulness I could assume. You may say that I have done that astonishing thing never done by a woman before, changed my mind. My companion remained silent and apparently thoughtful for some moments. When I stole a glance at her face, it had undergone one of the most marked changes of which her face was capable. There was a look of sweet, plaintive sadness about her eyes, and a tremulous tenderness about the mouth, and her voice was low and unutterably sweet and gentle. 
My dear, may I ask you a very solemn question? Are you doing just right in this matter? I have looked on with very deep interest during the past week to see what would be the result of all this. It seems to me that you hold a life in your hands. Poor Jerome! If you would see him, you would understand something of what he has suffered, and if you knew him as well as I do, you would tremble for what might be the consequence of this utter ignoring of his existence. He has had heavy troubles, has been weighed down with disappointment, and yet has contrived not to make shipwreck of himself. I have been so deeply interested in him for so many years, it seems as if he were my brother. And, Julia, I have looked to you to help him. He needs help, needs leading, and I know you can do it. And you can drive him into fury, too, if you choose. Would you rather save him or help push him down? I was touched by her words, yes, and flattered. I see the last plainly, now. Was I really such a power in his life as that? I answered, in not as decided a voice as I had used before. There are circumstances, Mrs. Tyndall, which make it quite impossible for me to continue a personal friend of Mr. Sayles. Mrs. Tyndall's eyebrows arched in that peculiar way she had, and her next sentence was full of surprise. Julia, I thought you were a temperance woman? Upon this she knew I prided myself, so I answered with emphasis, I am, decidedly. I shouldn't have imagined it, my dear, from your present mode of procedure. I assure you, dear child, if you want to make a drunkard of Jerome Sales, you couldn't take a more certain way than to cut his acquaintance. And how can you do that more thoroughly than to give up this project that has been so publicly planned and discussed? I know Jerome thoroughly, Julia, and I would not assume such a responsibility as you are talking for anything. I presume you think I am talking ignorantly, that I know nothing about the circumstances of which you spoke, but I do. I know every little detail. I knew it at the time it occurred. Mr. Tyndall had to meet the late train that night, and he came up town just behind Dr. Douglas. Then I heard it since from the poor fellow himself. I never saw any one so completely overcome. It isn't an hour, Julia, since he was here, and begged and entreated me to get you to see him. I promised I would try, and I told him he might call at half-past six to know the result. But, afterward, I determined not to interfere in the matter, but to leave it entirely to your own conscience. Only remember that your responsibility is fearful. Silence fell between us after that. Presently the little marble clock on the mantel chimed the half-hour, and almost immediately a servant appeared with a message. Mr. Sales in the back parlor to see Miss Reed and I went down in a very slow and bewildered way to meet him. End of chapter 13 Recording by Tricia G.